we lose more time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for joining us uh, today. We have a very, very special edition uh, for the KJB Leadership Series called Past Stories and Future Endings. Uh, it's special because it's going to be experimental. We, we have a graphic harvester who will be manifesting some of the stories for us today. We're going to be reimagining futures and we will uh, be listening to the voices of the KJB scholars who are part of the KJB program. What is the KJB program? The Klaus Jürgen Barter Leadership Program is a program that was started at the University of Cape Town in 2014 uh, to nurture and grow future leaders. It's a two year program where students at UCT on an undergraduate level from all faculties receive financial support, but also receive leadership programming, internships and other support for them to grow into who they are as future leaders. I'm very, very happy to have three such future leaders with us today. Uh, we have Peace, Carabo and Liz, uh, and um, they'll be sharing some of their thoughts around storytelling and around African leadership of the past and lessons for the future. We also have uh, Sonia with us today, who will be the artist in the house, and she'll be manifesting in a graphic way uh, some of the things, the, the gold nuggets of today. Um, so what is, what is this all about? Stories have been an important way in which to convey history and meaning across the African continent, from proverbs to folklore, our stories have lived on. The storyteller takes us on a journey and leaves us reflecting on a future where the lessons we have learned can hopefully be embedded. As we continue on the path towards future leadership, what better place to start than sharing the stories of African leaders of old, their visions and ideals? But what happens next? In this webinar, we will imagine a future where these ideals and visions are the foundation from which our continent is built. The end of the story is the beginning of the future. Join us around Iziko, the hearth, at the feet of the storytellers. I will now hand over to Karabo, and I will just ask Karabo to also introduce himself and each storyteller to introduce themselves since I uh, wanted to save time on giving an extended bio. So just a, a couple of words of who you are and share us your story. Thank you very much, Belissa. Um, yes. I am Karabo. I'm currently studying uh, for a BSc in civil engineering. Uh, one of my you know, big passions is to create circular resource economies in emerging, Af in emerging markets such as our African ones in a financially uh, you know, incentivized manner because what I found is that a big reason why uh, you know, sustainability projects aren't followed uh, is that they they tend not to make financial sense and so people are disincentivized to follow them. Um, yeah, and I find that, uh, you know, having leadership which kind of understands the situation on the ground is quite important uh, in this endeavor and that's what drew me towards, uh, you know, kind of researching and finding out about uh, past African leaders who have really uh, made made a mark on the continent and on the world. Uh, so yes, with that, um, I will um, sorry hand over to to Liz to introduce herself. Um, hello, uh, my name is Liz, and I'm studying mechanical and mechatronics. In I'll hand over to Peace now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peace Francis. I'm a final year medical student and I'm passionate about finding African solutions to African health needs. 
I will hand back over to Karabo to share his story. Thank you very much, Liz, and peace. Uh, right, uh, for my story, uh, I will share the uh, experience that I had. Uh, I had uh, the fortune of visiting Ethiopia not too long ago, visiting my girlfriend. And the first thing that struck me when I disembarked and got into the airport was that the clock seemed to be wrong. Uh, there was a geographical time difference of one hour between where I was leaving in Ethiopia. However, when I got there, the clocks were six hours apart. This was puzzling. Further to this, the date was seven years earlier than what I had expected. Now, quite disoriented, I realized that this was something I was going to need to clear up with the cab driver. Uh, and being able to communicate with this cab driver in English wasn't a guarantee, uh, given that in Ethiopia, the national language uh, is Amharic and they have no uh, European language as, as their official language. Now, when this trip occurred, I'd been to multiple African countries and I knew one thing for sure, and that's that an African country has a European country as its official language and then a local language plays second fiddle to that. So this further added to my disorientation. Uh, upon entering the cab, I implored the cab driver, you know, how is it that Ethiopia is bold enough to dictate its own time, year, and doing this in its own language without listing any European languages? And so with a wry smile and a beam of pride, he turned back to me and told me an African legend, which I'll be sharing with you today. Uh, so in 1844, a young prince born to a king in the Shiwa province of Ethiopia uh, claimed lineage directly from the biblical king Solomon and Queen Sheba. That is, King Solomon was his great, great, great grandfather. And in light of this, the prince's father named this prince Menelik, which is the same name that uh, King Solomon's son had. And this is the first king of Ethiopia who first, uh, you know, united the uh, Ethiopian empire. Uh, this name was prophetic uh, as our young prince would go on to reconstitute the, the Ethiopian empire much the same way that Menelik I constructed it uh, all those uh, centuries ago. So although born into royalty, our young prince's life was not without its challenges. At the age of 11, King Tewodros overthrew Menelik II's father, killing the man, taking the boy prisoner, and installing the prince's uncle as the ruler of Shewa. Now, despite the brutal nature of their acquaintance, King Tewodros raised young Menelik as a son, loving and educating the boy, and even telling him on multiple occasions that he would one day rule after him. Now, could it be that this king was subconsciously swayed by the prophecy? Who knows? After 10 years of being held hostage, the young prince mounted a daring escape from captivity. He made his way ho back home to the territory of Shewa to claim his rightful throne from the usurper Atto Bezabe with a handful of soldiers. There was no conflict upon his arrival. The superior army of Bezabe defected to the young prince uh, once he had arrived, and the people of Shewa, overjoyed at his return, uh, threw parties in the streets. The young prince showed shrewd leadership at this point by offering clemency to Bezabe and to the other members of the previous regime as he would initially need to rule alongside the members of this previous administration. So this made sense. Uh, Menelik's compassionate leadership was further underscored by his actions when his previous captor, King Tewodros, took his own life. After descending into madness, Tewodros uh, perpetrated numerous atrocities. He, you know, killed people wantonly, tortured people, uh, you know, without uh, without proper due process, and when he was eventually defeated in battle and led to led to uh, taking his own life, uh, people in the public celebrated. 
Now, our young prince was quite melancholic at this news since, uh, despite his madness, this uh, king to Wardrus had been like a father figure to him. However, he still marked the day a public holiday and sanctioned the festivities in order to please his people. This is the, the movings of a shrewd leader. Uh, and between this point and his ascent to complete emperor of Ethiopia, Menelik was wise in negotiations with local and foreign leaders. He amassed a sizable, a sizable arsenal of modern weapons and tactical strongholds and eventually managed to unify the nation's provinces behind him in his claim for the throne in 1889. Around the time of his coronation, a duplicitous deal presented by the Italians would set the ball rolling for one of the most glorious moments in, African his in the African continent's history. A diplomatic treaty with the ostensible aim of boosting trade was signed between the emperor and the Italians, one in Amharic and one in Italian. However, the latter dishonestly granted the Italians protectorate status over Ethiopia. Once Menelik learned of this perfidy, he rejected the clause. However, the Italians spent the next five years trying to force the emperor into subjugation and attempted to isolate him from global trade due to this rejection. The wily emperor played the European superpowers off each other, almost a reverse divide and conquer, if you will and managed to drastically expand, expand his arsenal despite all these blockades. And, he, uh, and, you know, ironically enough, he got arms from the French and from the Italians themselves. When the two European nations eventually collaborated in refusal to support Menelik, he issued the following battle cry. Enemies have now come upon us to ruin the country and change our religion. Our enemies have begun the affair by advancing and digging into the country like mole. With the help of God, I will not deliver up my country to them. Today, you who are strong, give me of your strength, and you who are weak, help me by prayer. This cry preceded the great battle of Adwa, where the Italians, descendants of the mighty Roman Empire, went to war with an African emperor branded globally as a leader of barbarians with no purpose further than to be dominated. The Italians severely underestimated the passion for independence that Menelik had instilled in his people. Having fulfilled the prophecy that bestowed upon him at birth to unite his country's provinces, the king summoned 100,000 soldiers and made light work of the European imperial army. Ever magnanimous, after the resounding battleground victory, Menelik treated Italian prisoners of war exceedingly well during the negotiations prior to signing the treaty, the treaty of Addis Ababa. His bringing the European nation to heel was consummated by the clause in this treaty, which stated that Italy recognized absolutely and without reserve the independence of the Ethiopian empire. With the conclusion of this tale, the cab driver made me understand that the bold and fearless leadership of Menelik, a man who never saw his country fall into protectorate or colonial status, has had been passed down to his people and continued with their decisions and the way they you know, set their own rules uh, all the way through to 2016 when I, when I went on this trip. Um, and yeah, for me, uh, this is... This is this is the story of, of a true African leader and one that I personally look up to uh, a great deal. So, yes, uh, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I will now hand over to Liz to share her her story about the, the, the African leader that she looks up to. Okay, so my story started in 1940 in a village on the slopes of Mount Kenya, where Wangari Mathai was born in a Kikuyu homestead as a third of six children. Kikuyu is one of the tribes in Kenya. According to the Kikuyu tradition, when a baby joined the community, a ritual was performed to introduce the infant to the value of the land of their ancestors and to show the good that had come from the soil. So even before Wangari was breastfed, she swallowed the juice of green bananas blue purple sugar cane and sweet potatoes, all of which are fruits of the local land. Wangari returned from the USA after completing her studies 
after Kenya had gained independence. For her first job, she became a lecturer at the University of Nairobi as one of three women. Here, she came to learn that she was getting paid less than her male colleagues, and so teamed up with one of her friends to fight this injustice. This is where she began her advocacy and activism. So at the university, when she was conducting research, she observed a lot of deforestation and soil loss. Many rural communities, like women, were also complaining that they did not have enough drinking water, firewood, food, income, uh, because they had planted cash crops like tea and coffee at the expense of the trees. So she suggested that they plant trees. This simple solution gave rise to the Green Belt Movement, which has ended up planting over 30 million trees and giving so many jobs to so many women, like thousands of women. So when the Green Belt Movement was just started, the new president, Arab Moi, was being sworn in. The parts of Wangari and President Moi crossed when a lawyer came to Wangari and informed her that there was a plan to build a 62-story skyscraper and a four-story statue of the president at Uhuru Park, which was like the last remaining green space in the city, uh, using the funds that they were going to borrow from international, co international communities like the World Bank. Um, she thought of it as ridiculous and filed a case, case, cause, sorry, case uh, court case yes, <laughs> against the president. Um, he was out of the country at that time. And when he landed at the airport, he had that some woman somewhere was trying to sue him. He said, um, that did not go anywhere. And for sure, I did not go anywhere. This incident took her back to the story of the hummingbird. The story is about a huge forest that is being consumed by fire. All the animals in the forest come out and watch the forest burning. They feel overwhelmed, powerless, except this little hummingbird. Uh, it says, I'm going to do something. And so it flies to the nearest stream, takes a drop of water and puts it on the fire. It goes up and down, up and down as fast as it can, trying to put out the fire with that little drop. So the other animals, the other bigger animals, much like the elephant, are standing there with its big trunk, which could bring much more water, doing nothing. They say to the hummingbird, what do you think you can do? You're too little. This fire is too big. Your wings are too little. Your beak so small. You can only bring a small drop, drop of water at a time. But as they continue to discourage it, it turns to them without wasting any time and tells them, I am doing the best I can. Wangari was the hummingbird. Instead of backing down and watching the forest get destroyed, she, she decided to do something no matter how small. So when the court process failed, she decided to use civil disobedience. There were several demonstrations at Furu Park um, her protest, the protest that she continuously had, gained attention from the world media, and the government got criticized heavily. And so investors pulled out and the plans for the building were dropped because there was just too much negative publicity. Overseas, her activism was winning praise, but in Kenya, the angered president used the police to attack and beat her. He would call her a mad woman and a threat to national security during public political rallies. He said, there's a certain troublesome woman. According to African traditions, women must respect their men. I ask you women, can't you discipline one of your own who has crossed the line? After this incident with the Huru Park, her friends did not want to be seen with her because she was disobedient at a time where disobedience was not tolerated. Such was the fear that the people had for the government. If you were seen to be on the wrong side of the government, the public avoided you because everyone had been muzzled at that time. Uh, realizing that she had become now a target and her life was in danger, she went into hiding. It was very common at that time for those who went against the government to be eliminated. And so not many years later, Uhuru Park again was the focus for protests for Wangari Madai and other women who staged a hunger strike for three days to push for the release of political prisoners who had been held without trial. She was again the voice uh, loud in a Kenya that was sunk in a dictatorial government. The police came to the tent where the protests were being held and started beating them. The, the beatings with patterns and tear gas was something that no one expected of a government, that, that's something that a government would do to its people. It did not matter if you are an 80-year-old woman or a professor like Wangari Madai. 
In the first round of beatings, Wangari got severely injured as she had been targeted and was beaten unconscious by the police. But this struggle was not easy because after a year of protest, 51 political prisoners were released. One day, a man was riding, who had been riding a horse in the Karura forest, um, which, which borders Nairobi city, um, noticed that there was a construction happening in the forest. He immediately called Wangari um, and asked if she knew what was happening. Wangari came rushing and only to find out that the forest was being, like there was encroachment that was happening in the forest. Um, President Moi had started giving the land to his political allies to construct luxury houses. And so she, she brought people, she mobilized a few people and went to rehabilitate that land. But the forest guards, the police, and even hired thugs would not let them plant the trees. Uh, this ended up in a really, really bad fight that left Wangari severely injured. She had put her life on the line, and that confrontation was when Karura was saved. In her, the, in her words, she said, if we are going to shed blood because of our land, we will. We are used to that. Our forefathers shed blood for our land. We will do so. This is my blood. The hummingbird had managed to put up the fire. In 2002, Moi was defeated in the general elections, paving the way for true democracy. Two years later, and six years after the Karura incident, Wangari was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for contribution to sustainable development, democracy, and peace. She became the first African woman and the first environmentalist to win the award. Wangari died in 2011 at the age of 79 due to the The greatest tribute was that people around the globe had been inspired by her vision. Wangari was the voice for those who could not articulate their concerns and those who could not stand up and say what they wanted to say. The end. So I'll pass over to, to Peace to continue. Join me as I tell a story about an unlikely leader. On the 16th of November, 1930, amidst the clash of Western and African civilization, in Ogidi, Nigeria, a boy was born. Chino Achebe, his story is one of excellent education and stories that took the form of both poetry and prose. W.B. Yeats said, turning and turning in the widening gaia, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. In these ominous words, this young man found the title to his first book, a book which told the story of the Igbo, highlighting the rich proverbs that season our speech. In that book, Africans, Nigerians, Igbos were the antagonists, the protagonists, the setting, the substance. He was told by many a publisher that the concept of an African novel was amusing. Some reviewers reported that they failed to see the point of African literature. What he did not know was that, that this was his introduction into leadership. As he wrote Things Fall Apart, he began to understand and value his traditional Igbo history even more. He also realized that people, even some across the waters, were able to relate to the story of the dispossession in Africa. Chino Achebe was part of a generation summoned to bear witness to Nigeria's transition from colony to independence. Amongst the joy of this momentous transition, Chino Achebe positioned himself as a leader who would not be silent in the face of injustice, be it injustice perpetrated by British colonists or by African opportunists. In writing Things Fall Apart, he started addressing his concern of the absence of the African voice. He realized that being part of the dialogue meant not only sitting at the table, but effectively telling the African story from an African perspective in full earshot of the world. Writing was serious business. It was a moral obligation. Using proverbs from our culture and history, colloquialisms, African expressive language, and the sensibilities of everyday people, he wrote back to the West attempting to reshape the dialogue between the colonized and the colonizer. Spurred on by his personal belief that if society is ill, the writer has the responsibility to point it out. He, together with his contemporaries, 
created a society of authors, aiming through their art to create an environment of good order in Nigeria. Little did he know that once you talk about making things better, you're talking about politics. There's a saying in Omofia, as a man dances, so the drums are beaten for him. Dancing into the political sphere, the drums of war began to beat. The late 1960s ushered in a period of ethnic resentment and violence. Murders and displacement and unity over one thing, the hatred of the evil, the hatred of the people our fearless leader called his own, the Biafran War. Amidst the atrocities of war, the le our leader was part of those imagining what this new country, torn away from Nigeria, could be. Inspired by Julius Nerere and his guiding principles of equality, self-determination, respect for human values, and grounding in traditional African values and principles, the Aihara Declaration was written. The Biafran flag, adorned with red to represent the blood shed during the fight for independence, black to symbolize the connection to souls of years past, green to signify Africa's natural wealth, resources, and abundant future, all reminiscent of Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanist teachings. Biafra, the land of the rising sun. It was in this war, in this land, that our hero became a soldier, a voice of the plight of his people, an intellectual who acted. In the end, Biafra collapsed. He, they, had spent years fighting for a cause, fighting for freedom, but it all collapsed. However, the story of this leader, much like the story of our continent, is one of continual rebirth. This story is of a leader who led and continued to lead, living out the words of Elie Wiesel, who reminded us that there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. Chinna Chibet turned down the honor of commander of the Federal Republic in protest. In stories and essays and poetry, Chinna Chibet continued to protest, leading voices that called out the reductionist view of Africa and voices that called out the self-serving leaders pillaging the continent. Dreaming of the day when leaders, humbled by the trust placed upon them by the people, will emerge willing to use the power given to them for the good of the people. Chinua Chepe yearned for true leadership while living the life of a leader. The face of African literature. Chinua Chepe said, I believe that it is impossible to write anything in Africa without some kind of commitment, some kind of message, some kind of protest. His protest lives on. Our elders say that the sun will shine on those who stand before it before it shines on those, those who kneel under them. And the sun shone on Chinua Chibet first. Thank you. I'm handing over to Felissa. Wow, I almost feel like we need a moment to let these stories sink in. Um, a little bit um, as extremely rich and um, reflective for us from the very wise cab driver in on the streets of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to the protesting and steadfast hummingbird uh, of Wangarai and the giant of a literature figure whose very act of art is resistance. Um, these three figures really do teach us a lesson of perseverance and challenge um, and, and, you know, fighting in your corner for a better world. So thank you for sharing those, those three incredible stories um, coming from you three incredible future leaders. I have a, a, a question for each one of you. And I think we will go with peace, sorry, with Liz first uh, for the first question. So the first question is, how can oral tradition in storytelling be made relevant for today? And how can this serve as a leadership tool? In other words, 
What is the future of storytelling? Liz. Okay, so I think a lot of the youth currently are using technology. So taking advantage of digital spaces such as Instagram, YouTube, and to tell the stories would be like a good way to start. Yes, so taking advantage of technology and digital spaces. You're muted. <laughs> All right, we'll go to Karabo next. Uh, how, how, what is the future of storytelling? And after Karabo, we'll go to Peace. Thank you very much, uh, Belissa. Uh, yes, I agree with uh, a lot of what uh, Liz was saying. Uh, it's, I think a big issue that uh, we face among the current generation of young Africans, myself included, is the lack of fluency in our indigenous languages. I mean, I can speak it, but uh, knowing the language on a deep level, effectively, or not knowing it on a deep level, effectively walls us off from much of the wisdom our grandparents have for us, particularly age-old wisdom that has taken years to refine, which pertains to living off land in a given environment. I mean, take away the spar and pick and pay in my home village, and put me there and I'll be in trouble. But, uh, you know, you put my grandmother in the same situation and she'll be mildly inconvenienced because she would know exactly what to do. So in my books, the future of storytelling entails, you know, letting, not letting our grandparents die with this wisdom, capturing it digitally, as Liz had mentioned, and, you know, buying some of the youth some time to, you know, have this awakening, realize that what our grandparents have to say is important and uh, get back up to speed with our roots in order to fully appreciate the wealth of knowledge that they can give us. Um, sorry, yeah, I'll hand over to Peace now. Thanks, Garabo. Um, so yeah, just building on that, I think an important uh, part of the future of storytelling is investing in our art and our stories. Um, so going back to Chino Chibet, he was very, um, he highlighted the importance of African literature. And I think what we need is more people to invest in it. There are so many different African stories that need to be told. Um, and the more resources these young voices, these old voices have to tell their story, um, the more stories I think we'll see. And I think that's part of the future um, of storytelling. Back to you, Melissa. Great. I have a fun question for each one of you, and I would also like to put it to the uh, public, to the audience listening. I think there's about 50 people online, um, and we have a Q&A section where you can post your questions. But here is a question for all of you. Uh, let me pick my question. What is the very next chapter in Africa's story? Please give a title and why. What is the very next chapter in Africa's story? Please give a newspaper, news headline, a title, and, and explain a little bit why. I would like this question to go to Peace first, then Liz, and then Karabo. Peace. So this is a fun question. Um, I think my title would be, and the world finally saw them. Um, because I think that Africa has always been a source of wealth, be it our wealth in terms of innovation, in terms of resources, in terms of intellectuals. Um, and I think we're finally getting to a point where the world is finally starting to see us and not just see in terms of glance at us, but see in terms of respect, in terms of value, in terms of inviting us to the table or seeing us as leaders. Um, so yeah, and the world finally saw them. Handing over to Liz. Okay, I would say my title will be the next generation of leaders. The reason why I chose this title is because um, there's not a day in the news that you don't see some sort of corruption or embezzling of public funds, even during like COVID-19. So it's good that new leaders, the new leaders who are coming have, um, you know, like they don't, they're not greedy or thinking of themselves always. So they think about the people and the planet before they put their interests so that we can 
stop this thing of embezzling funds or taking public land. And I think, yeah, that's that's what I would my title would be. Handing over to Karabo. Uh, thank you very much, Liz. Um, yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Belissa. Uh, if, if it were up to me, I would, uh, you know, title the next chapter, uh, Knowledge, Unity and Growth. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 like I've mentioned already, I think failure to, you know, ignorance rather, I should say, of how things could be um, and lack of faith uh, that we can come together to bring this about uh, is is what uh, what what stands in the way of of uh, you know a big part of what stands in the way of of African uh, progress. Uh, you know, I think and using the kind of stories from the past uh, imbues the listener with a sense of what is possible. Um, you know, Liz has, has made mention of things like corruption, which plagues so many African societies. Uh, with something as insidious as this. The rot sets in so slowly that people forget what things were like prior to their onset. Uh, and I feel like, uh, you know, uh, getting the knowledge out there of what things can be like, unity between Africans and uh, subsequent growth would be a good starting point. Um, I'll hand over to Belissa. So, uh, for me, those those titles sound ex sound uh, beautifully, positively framed, um, uh, looking forward to the future of, of the next generation of leaders um, and of the story, the dominant stories coming out of our continent uh, for that matter, um, since we have so many stories to tell. So thank you for, 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 for framing it in that way. Uh, I'm also seeing some of the Q&A coming through, which I'll publish shortly, um, which actually um, fits in nicely with my uh, third question um, and maybe answers some of the questions in the Q&A once I've published it. So those who are opposing, uh, who are opposing the questions uh, to listen carefully to this question. No one owns a narrative, but each of us have the privilege of holding the space to add to it. How do we build on the past lessons, experiences and learnings to carry the story forward? And what does this look like practically? I will hand over to Karabo, then Peace and then Liz, and then we'll go to the Q&A. Thank you, Karabo. All right, thank you for that, Belissa. Uh, yes, uh, just to, to keep it brief, I think the key way that uh, we can build on past lessons is to increase the you know the value of studying African history as as a profession um, and I think practical ways that this can be accomplished uh, could be you know having ministries dedicated to um, African history uh, in, in African governments and having it be an actually a lucrative career because I remember in, in my adolescence when I was choosing a career path uh, being a historian was the last thing uh, on my mind because you know I, I didn't associate with any with any sort of glamour or with any sort of progress, um, and I'm finding now that you know uh, history is quite cr quite crucial to progress. Um, and if I were to go to my younger self now and say this, uh, my younger self would probably respond to me, but okay, how am I gonna you know raise a family on that? And so I think that would be a, a, a key question to, I mean, a key area to, to tackle in order to, to make lessons from the past uh, something that we can actually learn from going forward. I will hand back to Belissa because I've forgotten the order, sorry. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. We've also got a request here on the Q&A to increase the visual. So I'd like our graphic harvester to just do a little bit of zooming in so that we can see the story unfolding a little bit better as we uh, continue with the questions. So the next um, person to speak on um, practical application of uh, storytelling is uh, Peace. 
Thanks, Felissa. So, uh, building on what Karabo said, I think as much as we, I agree that we need to um, solidify formal ways of studying history, but also the informal ways. Um, storytelling is quite an informal way of, of sharing our history, and I think we need to learn it. So, we need to take the time to learn our history, um, but also study it. So, study it in a more informal way, and that means uh, digging deep and understanding what lessons we need to unpack, what mistakes were made. And my parents used to speak of um, us as their kids as sort of like arrows or like arrows in their bow. Um, and what they meant is that where they end is where we start. And I think that um, that is one way of taking our history and using it practically is understanding that the mistakes that we made, um, the achievements that we won is the starting point. So our history is the starting point, um, but we need to learn it to understand that and put it into practice. Over to Liz. Okay, so I think uh, everyone has said like what I would like to say. It's about uh, personally what I would emphasize would be uh, educating ourselves, especially if we're talking about um, environmental conservation. We need to know like have this engaging conversations about climate change because it's happening at the moment. So we need to start talking about these things and taking action in our daily lives. Now that we've had the stories from our past leaders who are fighting to conserve the environment. What are we going to do in our daily lives to reduce the carbon footprint? So yeah, that's those are my thoughts to educate ourselves and to take action in our daily lives. Thank you, everybody. I, in terms of leadership lessons, what I've picked up is, you know, practical action, and that means in in a storytelling way, being the hummingbird no matter how small the drop is, that you're adding to the impact. And so storytelling has empowered us to use metaphors, ideas, and creative ways of communicating. So be the hummingbird. I also liked what Peace said about um, her advice from her parents around, you know, being the arrows in their bows, meaning that they are starting something, but she's being launched into the future to target something, to impact something into the future. So let us be each other's arrows and bows to help us along on our journey of targeted impact. So thank you for, for those visuals and thank you also to the Graphic Harvester for putting some of the those, those visuals in our oral traditions and oral storytelling. I'd like to go to the Q&A for the last uh, 10 or so minutes. Um, we have a couple of interesting ones. And I will just direct it to people who I feel could answer. If you feel you would like to hand it over to somebody else, say so. The first one is from Jennifer. I'm wondering about the truth and reconciliation process. This is obviously with regards to South Africa. My take is that the process was not completed. Could we activate past stories in our wounded communities to create healing endings? I'd like to hand over this um, question to Peace, who's also in the medical field. And although healing emotionally is different to healing physically, uh, the two are hand in hand. Peace, would you like to tackle this? Thanks, Felissa, and thank you, Jennifer, for the question. It is a tough one. Um, yeah, I think that uh, reconciliation, sometimes we think of it as an end goal, um, and we've reached reconciliation, but I think it's a continual process. So I do agree with you that we are still in the process of being reconciled. Um, and I think as a continent, there's very um, many stories of, of countries and people who also are still in that process of reconciliation. And I do, I do think that stories are a way to bring healing. Um, I think that sharing your story and having it heard is a very, very powerful way of getting healing. Um, and I think it's also important as, as we might be writing those stories, or we might be hearing them. Um, and it's important to take the time to really listen to these stories and to encourage people who have a story to tell and to amplify their voices. If that means buying books, um, encouraging other people to tell their stories, attending um, poetry sessions where people are telling their stories or creating spaces. Um, where people are encouraged to share these stories. Um, I think it's, it's important in the healing of, of our country um, and the healing of our continent. Back to you, Melissa.
Thank you, Peace. Something that struck me about what you've just said, uh, which could add to, to Jennifer's question, is really the difference between uh, listening and being heard. Uh, and that that's therein lies the nub, isn't it? It's not just about sharing stories, but it's really about receiving them with empathy and grace. Um, listening is very different to actually being heard. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much, Peace, for that um, on our continual journey of reconciliation and um, deepening our understanding about one another. The second question that has been posed online, um, I'm going to try. <laughs> okay, so there's a so there's a question for peace, but I think I'll I'll just skip that one so we can get to uh, another one and then we can go back to peace. Considering the massive influence that the West has on the stories we see, is it more important that we tell these stories in the media on our continent, or should we prioritize pushing for African stories to form part of the mainstream stories told even in the West? I'd like to hand this question over to Karabo. Uh, what would your cab driver say? Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Belissa, and uh, the, the asker of the question. This is a, you know, a really critical question. Um, you know, I'll answer it from, uh, give a sentence or two on the cab driver's perspective and then mine. Uh, I think the cab driver would be all for African stories being told by Africans. Um, you know, that, that gas pride, uh, you know, and I guess general mistrust of the West uh, would, would lead him to see things in that way, in my view. Uh, my belief is that, you know, what's, what's important is getting the stories out. Um, when when the stories are you know resounding and captivating, uh, they they will get across, uh, and it will, I, I believe that we will see them make their way uh, into uh, different cultures, much the same way that you know the most captivating Western or you know Oriental stories make their way uh, to the African continent and you know to other to other sorts of geographies. Uh, I think uh, if we get captivating stories. Uh, it won't matter whether we're telling them here. Um, their, you know, their essence will 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 carry them forward. Uh, but you know, in terms of uh, on 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 a on a practical scale, I think the key thing is to get practice telling the stories. Uh, and given that you know the West has given us the tools to get these things across, uh, you know, through, through things like social media, uh, through things like YouTube and, you know, these these little uh, doodle apps that you get uh, online where you can like draw uh, cartoons and what have you and animate them. Uh, I think it's important to use these to tell African stories and push them on our continent. And, you know, the best ones will kind of self-select and end up uh, getting ex exported, which which is my view. Uh, and yeah, I think a critical aspect of that I'll close with is that something like culture uh, is difficult to, you know, it's difficult for someone who is not African to come to Africa and tell an African, a truly African story. Uh, so I think um, having, being part of the African culture gives Africans an edge in terms of creating a compelling African story that Africans can relate to. So yeah, I'll close with that. Fantastic question. Uh, I will hand back to Belissa. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Kravo. It, it reminds me of, um, of two things. You, one can have a compelling story. Um, but if one doesn't have the space to ventilate an idea, uh, one has to claim the space. And your idea around social media and using the tools at our disposal, technology, to amplify the voices of untold stories is, is something that's of a clarion call for us. And, and I thank you for that. Um, there is also something you mentioned about culture being embedded in, in a person's worldview. You know, culture is beliefs, worldviews, it's, it's it's not just simply uh, you know a product that that has no in, intrinsic value. It it is inside you. It's your identity, uh, and these things need to be protected. Um, uh, and um, 
in, in France or in Canada, they call it the, the cultural exception. Uh, these things can't be commercialized. They almost need to be protected. Um, and, 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 you know, we can't have Hollywood um, inundating our, our media waves um, with, with the stories from the West, but we need to create spaces, if policies and quotas, in order to carve out that space for these stories to be heard. Because no matter how compelling a story is, if the space is not being carved out for that, um, it, it, the stories will be lost. So social media is definitely a democratized space um, and one should be encouraged to use that space um, to amplify the voices of those that tr traditionally have not had a mainstream voice. Thank you so much for that, for that question, very important question. Um, and that brings us to the, the end of our session where, you know, we have uh, at least a few, five more minutes until we, we end our session. Let's just see if there's any other question that we could um, end off with. Okay, there's a comment here. Wow, a leader with integrity and moral values in Africa who is walking with the citizens, someone who's not in it for themselves, but for the masses. So we're talking about these rare individuals who are walking and serving others. Um, there were a couple of words, um, Karabo, that you used when you talked about leadership. You talked about shrewd leadership of Menelik II. You talked about compassionate leadership. Um, you talked uh, then a uh, piece talked about, you know, be uh, art as as a protest and and using your voice for protest. If if nothing else, um, raise your voice to 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 serve and to support those who are voiceless. So these are kind of some of the values um, that are coming out of the stories of today's um, African leaders. And then lastly, uh, Luango has a question for peace. Thank you for all the stories. Peace, what is your favorite Chinua Achebe book and why? Peace. Um, I think I might be biased and this might be my favorite question, but I actually have the book right here with me. Um, it's a book called There Was a Country, A Personal History of Biafra. So um, his novels are amazing and so is his poetry, but I think this book he tells the story of the Biafran War, but he also tells the story of himself. And I love it because I get to see um, his thinking. And I think obviously you can see his passion and his hopes in his novels. But when you hear his words and how he was brought up and what he had to face, um, the true leadership and the true inspirations uh, shines through. So as much as it's a book, I've got little scribble notes all around in the margins. Um, I've underlined a couple of things and it's more like a textbook to me than anything else. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend it if you haven't read it. It's called There Was a Country by Chino Chibay. Excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. I would like to ask uh, Sonia, our graphic harvester, if she can um, uh, put a spotlight on some of the creations that she's created for us. If you can make it a little bit bigger so we can see some of the images some of the words that have been captured. This is a beautiful uh, manifestation of what we learned today in a very short amount of time. Uh, we only had one hour together and I'm hoping to post this um, image on the KJB Facebook site. So if you're not already a fan, not already following, please go to Facebook Klaus Jürgen Barter Leadership Program, uh, like our Facebook page and you will see some of these images and some of the captured notes in a visual form uh, from our storytellers. Uh, that brings me to the, uh, the close of our session, just to say thank you so much to the storytellers, Peace, Liz and Karabo. Thank you also to our partners, um, the Center for Extramural Studies, as well as uh, UCT's Futures Think Tank. Thank you to our artist, resident artist, Sonia, for her beautiful graphics. Uh, and thank you to the technical crew um, behind this particular session for giving so much support uh, from UCT. Uh, and thank you to the Klaus Jürgen Barter Leadership Program for carving out a space for storytelling. Uh, this is exactly a practical action for amplifying youth voices in order for us to understand one another, to embed the learnings of the past leaders and to really look towards future leadership um, and what we have um, 
to, to look forward to um, in terms of um, inspiration, creativity and uh, solution building for our future. Thank you to the audience as well for attending um, and for your questions and for being so engaged. Uh, and I hope to see you next month. We'll have the third edition of the Future Leadership Series on the 25th of November, which will be a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, and in this way, we will be looking not only on, uh, on, on an African or Pan-African level, we'll be now going global and we'll be tackling a global issue of concern. So I hope to see you again next month uh, and please do follow us on our website. You can see there on the screen as well as our Facebook site. Thank you and goodbye.